Welcome, my name is Thomas Jus Sørensen and I'm a chemist here at the Department of Chemistry at the Nanoscience Center at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, today I'm going to take 10 minutes of your time to tell you a little bit about dyes. Dyes are molecules that interact particularly well with the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So in order to understand how dyes operate, we're going to talk a little bit about how light and molecules interact. So dyes and pigments are amazing molecules. If you look around uh, today, you see m many colors on houses, on clothing, and also in art. And all of those colors wouldn't be possible if we didn't have dyes and pigments. So in the world before dyes, we lived a life without color. It's not exactly true because nature has always been colorful and beautiful. But uh, we didn't have access to pigments in order to paint our houses or to dye our clothes. And today we have dyes not only in these um, uh, functions, we also have dyes in our laptops, in the screens of our computers, in our fluorescent lamps. All of our high technology wouldn't work without functional dyes. For instance, uh, the internet is based on optical amplifiers that run on dyes. So we now have access to dyes. We can extract them from minerals or we can make them in the laboratory. Actually, the first chemical industry was based on fabricating dyes for paints and for dyeing fabrics. And uh, we have since started using dyes to dye our food. So in that, therefore we can now distinguish between natural and artificial dyes. The natural dyes are either extracted from nature or made exactly as they appear in nature in the laboratory. There's no difference whether it's extracted from a beetroot or it's made in the lab. But we also have artificial dye colors, uh, um, food colors, and particularly the blue is difficult to find in nature, so we make that in the lab. So my research is based on making artificial dyes, special dyes that can operate in high technology. And therefore, much of my research is also done with, if not direct collaboration with industry, then I'm collaborating at solving problems that appear in industry. But before we can start talking about my research, we have to have a look at uh, how light and matter interact. And we do that by returning to our primary light source, the sun. So if we place two cars in the sun, a black car and a white car, we all know that the black car will be significantly warmer to touch than the white car. And that's because even though both cars are exposed to the same amount of radiation, the black car absorbs a lot more of the light than the white car does. On in <clears throat> so that also means that the white car reflects more light than the black car does. So that gives us the two first processes we need to understand if we are to understand light and matter interactions. So when light hits an object, it can either be reflected or it's absorbed. If we look to the scientific model of how dye molecules and light interact, we describe the molecules by two lines. So either the molecules are in the ground state, which is the natural state of matter. It's the low energy state of a molecule. The other li line is the state that a molecule goes to when it's inter it has interacted with light, when it has absorbed a photon. So then we have a high energy state of the molecule, and that state is an excited state. So the absorption process when the light is absorbed, we describe as a line taking the molecule from the ground state to the excited state. So a molecule in an excited state has too much energy. It wants to dissipate this energy. In order to do so, something has to happen. And if we think about our black car, the, thing that, the process that occurs is dissipation of energy as heat. So most dyes, most normal dyes, will, when absorbing a photon, immediately convert the excess energy to heat. But that's not the only thing that can happen. 
a different process is the one we know if we put a comic book in a windowsill and let it sit in the sun for a while. F slowly the color fades. And that's because there's a different process that can occur from our excited state. So in our scientific model, we add another arrow. And that arrow corresponds to bleaching, which is a chemical process that destroys the dye. Typically, it's a process involving oxygen or and water. And two things can occur when a dye is bleached. We can either destroy the molecular structure, making the dye colorless, or we can destroy the dye completely, essentially turning it into ash. So now we have a scientific model for all the processes that occur in most dyes, in most normal dyes. So here's a picture of Copenhagen, where we have a series of beautiful colored houses. So most dyes has just one function, that is to make our life interesting. And those dyes just do those two things we saw before. They absorb light, generating color for our eyes, and they slowly fade. My research is concerned with special dyes. Dyes that does just only do these processes, but they do more. So they can also, when absorbing light, emit it again as light in a slightly different color. So my, the dyes I work with are fluorescent dyes, or luminescent dyes, or phosphorescent dyes. So in our scientific model, we have to add another process, and that is, again, an, a light process, so a process that involves light. So in the special dyes I work with, we have, after light absorption, the option of light emission again. The problem is, that light emission only occur if the conversion of the excited state energy into heat is slow. So light emission is a slow process. So the molecule spends a lot of time in the excited state, which makes bleaching highly probable. So it's important if you want to make a good fluorescent dye, a good emissive dye, that you eliminate bleaching. And my research is focused on making dyes that do not bleach at all. And I do that, so eliminating this process. So, and I do that in two different ways. We work with dyes that are based on carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So that is, this is called organic dyes. And the organic dyes we work with do not bleach, which is quite unique. There are may maybe two or three different classes of dye that actually do not bleach. Uh, one of the other types are actually what makes Ferraris red. So it's in the paint of cars. Our dyes are not like that, but they are fluorescent. A different way of making dyes that emit but do not bleach is by cheating and using the lanthanides, which are a group of elements situated almost always at the bottom of the periodic table. That don't make them less important. It's just a nice way of putting them, nice place to put them. So these elements are amazing in the sense that they can absorb light and emit light in different colors. So in these glasses are three different types of lanthanides and then the three different types mixed in one dye molecule. And as you can see, different elements can emit in red, green, and whitish blue. And because they are elements, single atoms, they cannot be destroyed, so they do not bleach. So why is it important to have emissive dyes? Why is fluorescence important? So most of our understanding of health, healthy biology and disease comes from the fact that we can see and follow processes within the cell. So in order to actually understand the cell, we need to see it. And that is done by fluorescent microscopy, where we attach dyes to specific parts of the cell. It could be the nucleus, the cell membrane, different structures within the cell. Or it could be we attach a dye to a specific disease marker, an enzyme, a protein, and we follow how that protein behaves in healthy tissue versus disease tissue, and we can try and understand how we can cure a specific disease. So a lot of work has been done over the last decades using fluorescent dyes in biology, but the limitation has been that we can only follow a process in a very short time because the dyes bleach. So we can take a picture and we can maybe take 10 pictures and the best case is 100 pictures and after that there are no 
dyes left, they have all been bleached. So using my dyes, so here we, a group of cells have been stained with five different of my dyes, and we can see the nucleus. And these images we can record once, twice, a thousand times. We can make a movie over days following the behavior of these cells. So that is what my research has accomplished, and it's quite interesting. So, so interesting that the Danish company Novo Nordisk are now testing these dyes in uh, their research and development. Before concluding, I would like to give a brief summary of the different processes that occur in, in dyes, as actually in most molecules. So if we are in the ground state, if we are in the, the basic form of all molecules and all matter, we can absorb light, which is a process that, where the dye molecule absorbs energy and goes from the ground state to the excited state. In the excited state, three processes can occur. Well, let's take this one, it popped in first. So the dye can bleach from in the excited state, which destroys dye molecule. The light can be absorbed and the energy can be released as heat. So these are the two processes that occur in all normal dyes, in all normal matter. Some special dyes, some special molecules can upon light absorption also emit the light again. That is, the light is released. Uh, light energy is re released again as light. And that's what gives us phosphorescent lamps. It gives us flat screen displays. And that's what I focus my research on. With that, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention.